as someone who sometimes sleeps to white noise, I found that um, very pleasantly uh, nap inducing. But now we're back, and we have actually like an extremely uh, exciting and fascinating group of projects to talk about um, right now. So um, before we do that, uh, I want to ask everyone uh, in your care pack. You might have, you should have gotten a link to a customized cheering button. Um, if you didn't find that and you don't see it in the chat, you can also just unmute and cheer. But we just want to send some love um, as these folks present their projects um, in an audio format. Um, so just be prepared in a minute. We're going to practice. And then after each uh, group, we're going to actually do some uh, cheering, either with the button or with uh, your, your hands and voices. Um, all right, so um, let's see. We've uh, hold on for one second here. Uh, all right, so we've got nine innovators um, who have developed platforms and coalitions and mediums inspired by the idea of bringing the qualities of the best public spaces online. And some of them are well known, some of them are little known. Um, some of them have been around for decades and some are still in development, but together they serve various communities locally and globally in different ways. And we're gonna kind of have a chance to explore um, how they do that. Um, the first group that we're gonna talk to is kind of grouped around decentralization. Um, the second around creating more uh, safe and inclusive spaces. And the third group around spaces structured for community and coalitions. And by the way, we'd love to hear about other projects um, for the pattern library we're hoping to build for the newsletter that Marina just talked about. So please add yours to the bulletin board, tweet at us at We Are New Public, um, or, or get in touch in another way. We'd love to hear about other projects that you feel like belong with um, this set. So before I introduce our first group, um, if folks can unmute and let's just uh, practice a, a joint cheer for what we're about to hear. Ready? Three, two, one, go. Decent. Yay! Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Hound dog. Hey. Oh. It sounded like sounded like people, which is a sound that I miss. Um, <laughs> all right. So um, we're going to uh, jump into our first group. And in our first group, we have uh, Darius Kazemi, who's going to talk about Friend Camp and uh, Run Your Own Social. We have Rabble, who will talk about uh, Planetary. And we have Golda Velez, who's going to share with us what's up with Blue Sky. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to dig into all of this. Um, why don't we start uh, with Darius? And Darius, I I'm just going to ask everyone to spend a couple minutes just sharing kind of what is your project? How does it work? Um, give us the overview. Sure, thanks. Can can you hear me? Are, are we good? Yeah, we're Great. good. Great. Um, I, I noticed in earlier sessions, people were doing a brief self-description for people who can't see. So I'm a bald dude with a beard and glasses in a sweater. Um, so uh, hi, my name is Darius Kazemi. Um, I am here to talk about, um, I guess it's like three projects that are kind of mixed together. Uh, the first is something that I do every single day. It's uh, the it's called uh, Friend Camp, uh, which is the icon on the right with the with the camping thing. I think if that's what's being or if is it just my face right now? I don't know what's being shown right now. Um, so Friend Camp is uh, a social network site. It's a small social network site uh, that I've been running for a group of about mm, 50, 60 friends for two years now, two and a half years. Um, and that comes out of my experience on the decentralized social web using Mastodon, which is a sort of better known like platform. Um, and I just, uh, I, I was a, an art bot creator on Twitter for many years. And uh, so I would make fun bots and toys and stuff. And uh, that, that platform became um, less amenable to bots after the 2016 elections. Uh, and it became hard for me to do my art practice on there anymore. So I was looking for new places to go. And Mastodon was one of those. Long story short, interest in Mastodon turned into an interest in running my own 
decentralized node of Mastodon for my friends, which was FriendCamp. And then FriendCamp started building up its own unique features, which then became Hometown, which is a fork of Mastodon that I maintain. Now it's an open source project. Uh, and that's built around principles that I developed uh, from my experience building FriendCamp uh, and running, more importantly, the building running FriendCamp, really. Um, uh, which I did a one-year um, Mozilla Open Web Fellowship where I kind of compiled all of these principles into a document called Run Your Own Social, uh, which is um, uh, a guide to running a small social network site for your friends. Uh, since a small social network site necessarily can't um, scale, I thought the best way to scale it was to just teach other people how to do it. So, um, so that's what Run Your Own Social ended up being, and you can find that on the web at runyourown.social. Um, and uh, yeah, I I guess, uh, let's see, I only have a couple seconds left, so I'm just gonna wrap it up. But uh, so I'm here to talk about FriendCamp, which is what you're seeing on the screen now, I think, um, Hometown, which is uh, the software that lets other people run a FriendCamp style space, and my Run Your Own Social principles. Uh, and I'm, I, I try to keep it as tech neutral as possible, so I wanna help people who aren't necessarily um, uh, into one particular uh, piece of technology. Uh, that's why I that's why I wrote Run Your Own Social to, to talk about the principles on top more so than the specific tech stuff. So anyway, uh, that's the overview. I'm excited to talk with the rest of everyone here about uh, what they're doing. Oh yeah, and there's the picture of all that code up on the screen. And I just wanted to put that there because I wanted to emphasize for people that when you run your own social network site for your friends, you are going to spend three or four hours a month at least squinting at something that looks like that. And it's a very specific skill set, which is why I think we need communities where there are individual people with specialized skills helping each other out. So, Thank you so much. And uh, I think we've got the slides sorted out now. Sorry that you had to be the guinea pig there. Okay. Um, uh, Rabble, uh, do you want to jump in? Tell us about your project. Yeah, so um, I was sort of briefly involved in the early stages of Twitter. And as we saw Twitter grow, it was a very open network in which there was no permission to build Twitter applications and people would create all sorts of things on their own. And it was very creative. And over time, once Twitter decided that its business model was advertising, that sort of open ecosystem got shut down. And so uh, I went and looked for communities that could build something that was a social application that could solve that better. And, and Planetary is built on this protocol called Secure Scuttlebutt, which lets you from your device, from your phone or your laptop, uh, communicate in a, a, a social application and build a variety of social applications on top of it. And so uh, we just actually launched in the App Store a few minutes ago. Uh, for iOS and it's part of an open protocol. And uh, the idea is that we should be managing our social spaces not as the sort of shopping mall metaphor nor relying on the state, but we should think of our public space as a commons. And so we're building it, designing it around Eleanor Ostrom's sort of eight principles of managing a commons, which is these online groups you need to have clearly defined boundaries. You need to have rules that match the local needs of these communities. You need to have those who are affected by the rules that apply to them have a say in those rules. Um, you need to have it clear that people have the authority to make their own rules about their digital spaces, sort of separate from outside authority. You need to be able to have a, a system by which users can monitor other people's behavior in the community. And then implement gradual escalating sanctions for rule violators. Um, and you need to provide a easy, low cost, simple way of dispute resolution. So can we block people? Can we kick people out? How do we decide who gets to say what kind of speech in this community? And then we need to build into the technology and the protocol responsibility for self-governing of these common resources. And so that you don't have a single flat public sphere like Twitter is trying to build or like the open web, but instead you have nested communities which have different sets of norms. And so with Planetary and the Scuttlebutt protocol, you have a series of pubs, which are servers that, that relay content and everything is driven by 
a cryptographic key pair that's locally defined on your device and you can move it from one compatible application to another. And that means that users stay in control and you get that sort of, um, what is it, the, the competitive collaboration or, or compatibility. You can take your identity from the Plan Jerry app and put it into the Miniverse app or the, the Patchwork app and your users and your content and your social relationships move with you, but you get a different experience and a different set of values. And, and that I think will open up a space by which we stop this problem of being stuck in who, who provides the legal framework to decide what we can, we can speak and how we can speak. And so that's what we're building. It's planetary.social and uh, I'll drop the link into the app store um, as soon as I'm done. Thanks. Congratulations. That's a big day. Um, yeah. Golda, uh, you are uh, involved in the Blue Sky Project. Can you tell us a little bit about that for folks who don't know what it is and what you're up to with it? Sure. And uh, yeah, so I'm Golda Velez. Uh, I'm a white woman and I, I have kind of an inherited Brooklyn accent, even though I've never been to New York. So um and uh, yeah, I am in the blue sky discussion space. It, it, and it's something that Twitter made an announcement a little over a year ago that uh, they wanted to support uh, the development of an open and decentralized standard for social media and that they would be a client of that standard. And for those of us who are hoping for this decentralization or, or like Rabble said, who you know used to be on this nice open ecosystem that then disappeared, um, that was really hopeful. Um, because Twitter, of course, has this huge user base and you know, anybody can invent a decentralized ecosystem, but until you have your friends on it and everybody's on it and there's enough critical mass, it's really hard to get that rolling. Um, so anyway, so that was very, very exciting. Um, a lot of us, uh, or I made efforts to get into that space. Uh, I, I posted things about it. I went and got interviewed at Twitter and I talked to people and then they allowed me into the discussion space. Rabble is also in the discussion space. He was probably just invited in the first place. Um, but uh, in any case, um, so there is this discussion space that's been on for about a year and it, it's been a semi-private space where initially it was just the invitees and then uh, we got Twitter to like say, okay, hey, does anybody else want to join? And we went around and invited some people. So, so there are a lot of people in the space. Uh, there's folks from Solid, there's folks from Mastodon, uh, there's folks from uh, Act, you know, Activity Pub also, which is you know, related to Mastodon, uh, the Gun Stack, um, the Matrix people, uh, you know, and there, there's a lot of you know, folks who have really been deeply involved in decentralization and we and we've been discussing for like a year uh kind of what are the different approaches you know there's there's the identity layer there's the networking layer there's the data storage layer um and then there's the big problems on top of that which is rep, you know reputation and misinformation which is my kind of interest in discovery and search which are kind of naturally centralized things and how do you do them in a decentralized space um and there's just there's just a lot of stuff in there like federation versus peer-to-peer um, so you can see why it's taking us a while. But <laughs> the, the real reason why it's taken so long to come out is we didn't realize at the beginning that Twitter was not going to direct this. That, you know, Twitter actually, I don't know if you realize also, Twitter has a lot of engineers already. Some of them are pretty smart. And if they just wanted someone to design a decentralized space, they could have like picked five guys and like, hey guys, design this decentralized space. But they had Blue Sky because they needed something they couldn't do. And what that is, they needed something that was not Twitter. And that's one thing they can't do. Um, so we are doing that and we had to realize that we had to drive the conversation and we had to like proactively say, hey, uh, let's do our proposals now. <laughs> so, so it took us a while to ramp up to that. There's gonna be an ecosystem doc that comes out that has a really a kind of a good technical overview of a lot of the different things in the space. Um, and then now a number of us have made proposals that Twitter is going to presumably choose from. Um, my proposal has to do with encapsulation, I'm I'm actually also a kind of just a normal software engineer. My company just got bought by Uber, so I work for Uber right now. Um, so uh, mine has to do with message encapsulation, and I'm unaware of the time. But I just have a minute left. Um, that uh, wherever the message is, just by reading the message, you have to know how to respond to it and what you can do with it. And that's my idea is to encapsulate things and, and a few more details than that. So mine's published on Hacker Noon. If you look at Hacker Noon, Blue Sky, you probably will find it. Um, and I just wanted to wrap up um, by quoting Jack on um, 
one of these things, he, he did join our initial conversation. He told us uh, the biggest and long, long-term goal is to build a durable and open protocol for public conversation, that it not be owned by any, any one organization, but contributed by as many as possible, and that it is born and evolved on the internet with the same principle. So um, we're trying to evolve it. And if you want to find out about it, uh, it's going to be more public. But right now, if you just go to Twitter Blue Sky and start making some noise, someone should probably answer you. Wonderful. Thank you. So um, I'd like to go back around to each of you uh, first, and then we'll kind of get into some conversation. But um, in the same order, can you just talk a little bit about like, why, why do you, what's driving you, what's motivating you to build this kind of thing? Why, why do you care about this? Um, yeah. Uh, you start. Yeah, I'm building this because I want to have a nice time on the internet with my friends. And this is a way for me to do it and it's worked so far. So uh, I want to spread that to, to other people. That's it. That's a reasonable aspiration. Rebel. I mean, that's a great question. So in part, I'm building it because I feel like there was a path in sort of the web 2.0 social networking, social media apps uh, that was derived from open standards and open protocols and open APIs. And we lost that. We kind of, we had this playful space where people were creating all sorts of stuff and defining the future. And then uh, we stumbled into the fact that there's a lot of advertising money to be made on this surveillance model of social media. And that's fine for those companies, but it's also deeply problematic. And um, I think that, you know, it's easy to criticize what Facebook and Twitter and others do for their decisions about how they legislate what speech is allowed, but it's an, a completely unfair problem. Like, it's, it's a bunch of well-meaning people who are trying really hard who have an impossible task and they have an impossible task because it's it's structured wrong. And so I wanna build something that's structured on human scale, that's structured on the fact that we as people get together and can come together and solve problems without having to rely on either sort of heavy handed government regulation or the shopping mall deciding, you know, what the, the mall cop will enforce. Well said. No. Very well put. Um, yeah, I mean, my motivation is uh, really that the misinformation out there and, and the not only misinformation, but the disinformation attacks on people, uh, obviously, a, even a year ago, were spilling out of the virtual space into the real world space and, and directly harming people. Uh, there's a lot of people, and especially in other countries, who are in, in very serious physical danger because of uh, either misinformation or because of repression of information. And so attacking this problem is very visceral to me that, that we've got to do something about it. And also I just, uh, like they said, uh, you know, both Darius and Rebel, it's like, there's so much more creativity that could happen. And, and just from an engineering point of view, um, you know, this dinosaur model isn't good. Let's, you know, have a meteor hit and get some mammals. <laughs> um, I like it. Um, so, so, uh, uh, a kind of ethos that all three of these projects have embraced is kind of this decentralization notion. And I just, I wonder if you could each, uh, or, or if any of you could reflect on what problems does decentralization solve and what problems does it not solve? Like what's, what's it good for and what's it not good for? Um, well, one thing it solves hopefully is the ability to escape the silo. Because if you manage to have a decentralized protocol and people have adopted it, then you can talk to your friends even if they don't use your same app. So that's a problem it's hopefully good for. A problem it's not good for is it doesn't necessarily do anything to address the spread of misinformation unless you build some stuff on top of it. Yeah, I mean, I would say that that's one of the really tricky parts is that we have a bunch of people who are very socially progressive and well-meaning working on building these tools. And maybe 20 years ago, it would be like, well, if we just give voice to the voiceless and empower people, then uh, you know, it'll be this liberatory thing. And, and the reality is that what we need to do is both design systems that let people provide checks and accountabilities and realize that 
just like you can't control the speech of someone at a bar where they're trying to, you know, saying racist things, you can't control that kind of speech. But what you can do is give people better tools. And right now we're dependent on centralized tools or, or just building on top of it. So like, um, you know, Block Party was a fantastic tool you'll hear about in a few minutes, is built on providing security and protection to users of social media apps that the, the platform providers aren't doing. And so what we need to do is have the ability for us to create and incorporate those kind of protections rather than trying to bolt on. The bolting on is great, but like rather than just bolt on to existing platforms where they can delete you at any moment. Yeah. Um, I mean, it brings to mind, obviously, a lot of the events of the last uh, week in terms of, um, and I think, uh, you know, Ethan Zuckerman, who we'll hear from tomorrow, has a really interesting piece on kind of how will what's happening now with the deplatforming of Trump lead to a, um, might it lead to a kind of alt-right tech ecosystem? Um, how should we think about sort of the, you um, you know, the, 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 the virtues of, um, a, a, you know, a multiplicity of spaces versus just one. I, I mean, I, when I talk, when I talk about this sort of thing, um, uh, I often think about, uh, sort of getting back to what Rabble was saying a little earlier, like, you know, I can't tell somebody to not, uh, say something in their own home. Right. And that's, I mean, you know, have whatever thoughts you want in your head or in your private spaces or whatever. Uh, you could, you could, you could call for my own personal death in your own home, I guess. Sure. I wouldn't like it. But I'm not super, uh, sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting someone's um, speech over here and it's kind of looks, look, looks like they just muted. Okay, cool. Great. Um, what, what my hope is, um, is that yeah you'll have these different political um uh polarized decentralized places you'll also have other places too not places that are apolitical because that doesn't exist but places that are built around ethoses that aren't necessarily tied to a particular um you know political party or 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 ideology or anything like that uh and and what what i'm trying to do is create spaces that are good and and like fun to be in like actively pleasurable to be in um uh on the assumption that the people who are in these uh super hyper polarized spaces um are they're freaking miserable they 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 actually hate their lives um and uh and i want to provide a place or and let other people provide places where they can come where they don't hate their lives anymore um and uh and th that's the hook right the hook is not oh it's decentralized it's this it's that the hook is you'll be happier if you're here um and then that's also going to change how you relate to your community as well i i, I love what you said darius because i think there's really two sides to this coin and, and i think we were in this in one of the earlier discussions is one is like what you're doing is making a creative safe space where people can open and create together and then the other is what do we do when people actually do do bad things and i think it's very ironic right now that you know parlor has migrated to gab which was written by people who are incredibly progressive and now that software is being used by you know by these what i would say is is you know nut jobs who are trying to hurt other people and i and i think that my answer to the other side of the coin, not the part you were just talking about, is you have to have a federated system with accountability where it's like, you know what, if you even talk to him, I'm not going to carry your traffic. And, and I would say you only go to that level if somebody's actually going to like kill somebody. But I think that you do have to have a graduated system of sanctions, just like, you know, Ullman talks about. And at the highest level of sanctions is that if you are part of our federation um, you can't help these guys because they're trying to kill people. And then there's many, many levels lower than that where there'd be graduated levels. And you have to have some, you know, democratic work-weighted way of agreeing on what those things are. So I, so I really think we have to create some kind of federation that has agreements between each other um, that doesn't try to overemphasize brittle values, but does recognize that some things have to be there. I want to uh, try to wedge in one other question. Uh, such a fascinating conversation. Um, Darius, I loved uh, what you wrote on uh, the Run Your Own Social website 
uh, you wrote, uh, most of the problems that exist are social problems with social solutions. And I've tried to lay some of these out. There are still some unsolved problems where better tech can help. Um, and so, you know, this question of like, what jobs should technology do and what jobs are actually sort of like people layer jobs? I'd just be curious for each of you to reflect on, on that. I'll jump in first. I mean, so we're designing technology and Ethan will probably talk about this, but like the technology we design can't define who uses it, but we can choose what affordance it has. Like do the affordances drive people in certain behavior or other? Do they create space by which people can effectively do that moderation, that governance, that community management? You know, what is called an offline space is sort of unpaid emotional labor. Can they do that? And then can we then design systems that regularize that incorporate it? Like right now, I on a regular basis get contacted by Antifa and Black Lives Matter and journalists from all over the world who have had their accounts deleted or suspended on Twitter and Instagram. And then I have to use my personal social connections to backdoor to constantly get these accounts restored. I don't wanna have to do that anymore. And so like, how do, we, how do we build software that has that social role as part of it? Darius or Goldie, do you have a quick final thought on this? Just that what uh, Rebel said is really important because that happens too. Uh, there's actually, you know, any tool you build, the attackers will use it. So if you have a reporting tool, the attackers will have coordinated reporting attacks on the people they don't like. And also that the bad guys usually have more money. And so you really just have to be aware of these tools that you make, including the blocking and the reporting and the banning, that these are all going to be misused. And so that's I guess I guess one other thing that I would add is that um, keeping the uh, these sort of nodes of communities that self manage um, smaller, like really small, like 50 people, um, means that there's no there's less of a danger of context collapse. There's more room for nuance. There's more room for like, oh, okay, this person said this, but here's where they're coming from, so we can take a better approach to like, you know, calling them in on what they said or whatever. Um, uh, there's uh, the other the other main thing for me with keeping it small um, is that uh, you can. What do I want to say? Um, uh, so like with the uh, with like the attack vectors and that sort of thing. Like, well, no one who has right access to my reporting system is someone who I don't personally know, right? So I'm not worried about our reporting system being used as an attack vector. So. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and I think you have to have different levels, the same as you have different levels of sanctions, you need different levels of trust. And that needs to be more recognized. Because right now, all we have is kind of this friend, or follow or like, and it, I can't say that, oh, yeah, I've met Darius, I, I'm pretty sure he's actually a human being. And, uh, you know, and I, I can't actually express that anywhere online. Um, so I think we need a lot more granular ability to report in like a really smooth way. All right. Um, well, we could have gone on for, for much longer, but thank you all for your work and for um, what you're building. And this is that moment where uh, if folks will unmute with me, we're just going to send you off with some appreciation. So thank you. Okay.